Okay, let's get back into fun things. So, uh, relatively fun, I guess. Uh, so, what are the regular operations? Union, concatenation, and star. So, if I say regular operations, would I ever mean anything else? I might deceive you once, but uh, no, no, it really is union, concatenation, and star. Okay, but we talked about before um, these examples of DFAs where we saw that uh, we can just flip what states are final and not final, and uh, there's some relation between the language that we obtain afterward and the one that we had before, before we flip the final and non-final states. So there's one more operation. It's not a regular operation, okay? Uh, but it is another operation that we can consider called complement. And I'll reiterate, uh, not uh, a regular operation. So uh, so for a language L, the complement is, uh, and the way we write the complement is L with a little bar on the top of it. So uh, in some uh, places, including one of the papers I published in this area, we write uh, L to the C sometimes. Um, but the convention that we're going to do in this class is L with a bar on the top. And so this is the set of all strings that are uh, also not in L. So take all possible strings, remove all the ones that belong to L, you got the complement. So just like in normal sets, we define a universe, we have some set, the complement is everything not in that set. And the way we write that is sigma star uh, minus L. So start off with all possible strings, take all the ones in L away, you get the complement. Um, I've seen notation like uh, sigma star with a diagonal slash L. Uh, and I may switch between the two, but I'll try to stick with L bar because that means the complement. Okay? Um, any questions on what complement actually is? Yeah. What makes an operation Yeah, so I mentioned before, just because it's called regular, it has nothing to do with the um, regular languages. It turns out it has application with regular expressions. So that's where that comes from. Uh, it's just an unfortunate consequence of this area that like multiple areas develop this notion of regularity and when they finally converge now we have multiple competing uh, uses of the word. So it, it's rather unfortunate but it's just the terminology that's used. So we gotta live with it for all eternity. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. If you publish code uh, and other people use it, you have to live with it for all eternity. Okay? So it just, uh, if you're so fortunate to make notation like this, think about it a little bit first before you actually use it. Okay, so uh, we're going to actually now go to our first theorem of the class. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's not a regular operation. Yeah, so uh, it is an operation, but it's not one of the regular operations because that's different. Okay. So uh, let's prove our first theorem, which is that the regular, oh, and I should say, if my handwriting is atrocious, uh, please tell me so I can fix it, or try to at least. So regular languages are closed under complement. So can anyone tell me informally what this is stating? That the complement of all the, the themes of the languages is part of the same language. Right. So if I take any old regular language that you that you want, form the complement of it, they're 
the resulting language is also regular. It can never be not regular. Okay? How in the world are we going to prove that? Just put minus a few details here, QED at the end, and we're done. Well, let's see. So suppose uh, L is a regular language. What do we want to prove about L with uh, regard to L? So I'm saying L is arbitrary regular language. What do I want to prove? Yeah, is complement is also regular. So maybe we want to keep a thought bubble over here. Uh, want uh, L bar is also regular. Okay. Hmm. Can anyone help me out? Okay, well, we have L is regular. Does anyone know what that means? Oh, yeah, that might be useful. Uh, L is regular. There, there exists a DFA for it. Okay, great. So this implies there exists a DFA uh, M with uh, some states, some input alphabet, transition, start state, final states, with uh, language, with language L. So it really has the right language because we assumed that L is regular. Cool. Let's see. Well, let's pick a string that the DFA does accept, okay? So it does accept the string. Well, how can I possibly form a DFA for the complement? What did we do before to the states? So change them from final to non-final. So we're going to form a DFA M prime to be, well, am I going to change the states themselves, not the fact that they're final or not, the actual states themselves? Am I changing them? No. Am I going to change the input alphabet, the transitions, or the start state? No. So those four pieces are going to stay exactly the same. There's a trend here. Therefore, the fifth piece must also be the same. What is the fifth piece here? What are the final states in this case? The complement with respect to what here? The states themselves. So uh, to make it more precise, I'm going to actually explicitly write the minus here. So Q minus F here. Okay, so the only thing I'm changing is the set of final states at the end. Just invert the final and non-final states. Any questions about that so far? Does M prime have language L bar here? What oh, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, when you were saying to switch the even length string and odd length string so that they mm -hmm. are the complements, I guess, you were saying you could just switch the start? Uh, yeah, so that's another way you can do it, but it only works in that particular case because the DFA is symmetric. Oh, okay. But it, but it only works in that case. If I flip the final and non-final, that always works to the complement. In that case, it happened to work with the states, too. Um, does this DFA M prime have language L bar? Does it have the complement just from doing this? Does this prove it? No. How do we prove it? So the, someone asked a question uh, maybe before the class. We're not aiming for full-fledged proofs here. Okay, so you, you don't have to set up a basic step, induction step, whatever. We're just going to focus on enough detail so someone can make a proof like that. Something that is communicatable uh, and provides enough detail. Okay, well, we'll consider any string at all with M. Okay, so with M up here, 
pick any string at all and just run m on that string. Well, it lands in some state, right? What if that state was accepting? Uh, does it belong to the language of M? Well, let's see. If we pick any uh, W in sigma star, so it's not necessarily accepted by M at all. It's just any string at all. Well, let's see. The two possibilities are W uh, belongs to the language of M, right? So uh, it either it belongs to the language of M or it doesn't. It's one of those two cases. Well, let's see. If it does belong to the language of M, what did M do on that string? If it belongs to the language of the machine M, what did it do on that string? Ah, it had an accepting computation, meaning it landed in what kind of state? A final state. Okay, great. So the computation of M on W had Rn, the last state, uh, be a member of the set of final states. That's just by definition. Well, if M prime is destined to have the uh, language L bar, should M prime accept W also? No, because we want M and M prime to completely disagree. If M accepts the string, as the case here, we want M prime to not accept the string. Well, what does M prime do on this particular string? It lands in the same state, but is it final now? No, what did we do? We switched the final and non-final states. So uh, M prime's computation on the same string had it land in a non-final state. Does it accept it then? No, great. So this implies uh, the same thing of uh, M prime on W has uh, M prime not accept W, which implies W uh, uh, does not belong to the language of M prime because it doesn't accept it. Well, the other case is that W is not accepted by M, the original machine. Well, what does M prime do now? It has to accept it. What did M do, the original machine do? It landed in a non-final state by definition because it's not in the language. Well, since we didn't change the machine other than the final states, what did M prime do? It landed in a final state. So uh, by similar reasoning, we have that uh, W is in the language of M prime. So these languages are completely disjoint. Okay? Well, let's see. If I just have disjoint languages, there's nothing in common between them. Does it mean that M prime's language by that is the complement of M's language? Just because they're disjoint? No. So what does it make it so that M prime really does have the complement? It's from here. We picked any string at all, regardless of whether M accepts it at all. So we picked any string at all, which means that they completely disagree. So they're disjoint, and their union is everything, because one of those two cases must happen for every string. So that must mean that uh, the language of M prime is the complement of the original machine's language. So whatever the original machine's language is, um, M prime's language is the complement of it. It accepts 
all the other strings, exactly all the other strings, and no other strings. Well, wait, what does that say? What does that say about complement? Well, we made a machine that is the complement of this machine. Does that prove for this one machine that all regular languages are closed in their complement? No. Because we looked at one machine, right? How many machines are there? Infinitely many. But look, I picked an arbitrary regular language. So any regular language counts. So we picked any regular language and we made a DFA for the complement. Okay? So that must mean what about regular languages? Are they closed in the complement? We started off with an arbitrary regular language and we made a DFA for the complement of it. So, for that reason, regular languages are closed under complement. So that's probably more uh, detail than we actually needed here. Um, you could have just said that um, uh, whatever the computation M did on the string, it landed in some state. Whether it's final or not, if it was final before, it's not now in M prime. And if it wasn't before, it is now in M prime because we switched the final states. And so if we accepted the string before, we don't now. And if we didn't accept the string before, we do accept it now. Okay? Any questions on this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I meant to say the computation again, and I didn't want to have to rewrite it. I'll rewrite it. Yeah. Uh, that was me being lazy. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what does the line right here mean for L of M bar on the top? Complement. So L of M complement. Yeah, so that, that's exactly the same. Uh, yeah, same as apostrophe, same as C up in, upstairs, but the way that we're going to use it is bar upstairs. Other questions? Okay, so let's uh, prove some more stuff. Well, let's actually uh, consider questions like those in the homework. We have um, uh, W being a member of having some property, like an even number of zeros or something, and, and has also that has at least three ones, for example. So it has multiple properties. Actually, let's look at that. So let's say that W in 0, 1 star, such that uh, W has exactly two zeros and at least three ones. So that could be a language that uh, we can consider. So what do we want to prove about languages like this? That, that it's regular, right. So, uh, and what does regular language mean? Create a DFA out of it. So if we want to figure out how to make a DFA out of this, well, could we say, well, let's make a DFA for the first piece, the exactly two zeros piece, and then make another DFA for the at least three ones piece, and then if uh, regular languages are closed under intersection, can I make a DFA for this whole thing? Yeah. What if I 
uh, wanted, instead of and, I wanted or. And this is inclusive or, not exclusive or. So if I can prove that regular languages are closed under union, could I make a DFA for this entire thing? Yeah, because or is just union, and is just intersection. So let's actually look at uh, union, because we'll actually get intersection for free out of that. So let's look at intersection. I want to show the following. Uh, regular languages are closed under union. Because if we get that, we get this problem for free. Well, maybe not free, but cheap. So here's an idea that is not going to work. I'm, I'm telling you in advance. I'm giving you warning. It's not going to work. Okay? So picture the two DFAs here. So run the first machine on the input W. If it says accept or it lands in a final state, should it belong to the union? This string belongs to the union. So if at least one of the two machines says yes, should I say yes to the union? Yeah. So run the first machine on that string. If it says yes, great, we're done. If it says no, rerun the same string on the other machine. If it says yes, then it's in the union. If it says no, well, both machines said no, so it's not in the union. What's wrong with that idea? Seems reasonable, but what's wrong with it? Yeah. No, no, it is deterministic because each piece is a DFA, so it does the exact same thing every time. Oh, so something related to, well, if we have a DFA and we consume a character, could we go back? Mm. So once we consume the input on the first DFA, we're toast for the second DFA. Burnt toast. So what do we actually do then? Well, we only really have one chance of doing all the computation we need over that string. We can't go back, we can't restart. So what do we do? What, sorry? Oh, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. Let's, if we can combine them into one gigantic DFA, that might be good. Well, let's see, what could we do? Well, let's actually do an example that I have conveniently already made. So let's take these two examples just to motivate the discussion. So this is not the proof, but it's uh, motivation. And the other one is this one. So here are the two DFAs I want to consider for now. So let's consider the string uh, 101. Is it in the union? Look at the first machine. What does it do on 101? And it ends in accept state. So is it in the union? Yeah. Well, uh, what about the R0, uh, sorry, the second DFA? What does it do? It, it does the same, uh, essentially the same thing. It goes to R1, back to R0, and then finally to R1. Well, if we only have one chance of working with this string 101, could we just keep track at the same time what state we are in in both machines? So at the very start, what state are we in of both machines? Q0 and R0. So what we want to do is let's do the transitions at the same time so that we 
uh, do the first transition at the same time, then the second one. So we do them in tandem. So we don't have that issue of rerunning the string. So Q0 and R0, what does the first character take them to? What does the top one go to? Goes to Q1. Where does the bottom one go? Goes to R1. What does the zero do? It, they go back on both machines, and then the one obviously takes them back again. So the idea is we're taking into account the two states that we are in and doing the transitions at the exact same time so that we don't have any issue. Okay, great. Well, let's actually prove this then. So let's let, uh, let there be two DFAs. So I'm going to call the first one M1 with uh, ones in the subscripts everywhere. And then M2 is the same idea, but with a two in the subscript. Uh, BDFAs. Okay, so I'm just picking uh, two arbitrary DFAs. Is this sufficient uh, in terms of uh, getting from regular language to DFAs? Yeah, because I'm picking two arbitrary DFAs here. So that corresponds to arbitrary regular languages. So if we can get a DFA for the union here, then we're all set. So, what could we do? Well, going back to the example we had before, well, let's see. Could we potentially be in Q0 and R0 at the same time? Yeah, at the beginning we always are. Uh, what about Q0 and R1 at the same time? I'm saying in, in principle, could that happen? Yeah, what about the reverse, where we have uh, Q1 and R0? Yeah, what about Q1, R1? Yeah, so one of, my, um, one of my recommendations for whenever you make DFAs or machines or whatever is consider all of the possibilities that could occur, make a state for each one of those possibilities. So how many possibilities of pairs of states could we have? Four, because there are four combinations here. Let's make four states then. So uh, we have a Q0, let's call one state Q0, R0. I'm just making a new DFA from this. And then let's make another one Q0, R1. And then over here, let's have the Q1 versions. Q1, R1. Oh, that's, so, th so that kind of works. Maybe then we can just put the transitions, uh, uh, putting the combinations to each other so that we can relate one to the other. Um, what is the start state here? Or what should be the start state be? Q0, R0, because those are the two start states in the original things. Um, because we're doing union here, what should the final states be? Well, if we land in Q1, does, do we care what the second DFA did? No. So anything with Q1 in it is a final state. So these three are. Um, uh, what about the second machine? It, so anything with R1 also should be final. So I'm going to make that guy final too. So I don't want to, for brevity of time, I don't want to write all eight transitions that are going to happen. So let's just do one pair. Let's do the Q0, R0 state, the start state. Uh, what of the four states should that go to on input zero? So what did the first machine do on zero? It stayed in Q0, so it's definitely going to be one of the two Q0 states. Uh, what did the second machine do on zero? R1. To R1. So what is the state that we should go to? Q0, R1. 
Q0, R1. So that comes down here on 0. What about on 1? Where should that go? Yeah, Q1, R1, because we just follow the first one, and then we follow the second one wherever they go. Oh, the many places we'll go. Um, okay, and then you can fill out uh, on your own time the other six transitions that can occur. Or, or you, you actually you have to because they're DFAs. Um, anyway, uh, let's go to the general case unless there are questions about the example. Yeah. Oh, what's sorry? Yeah. So this is the um, uh, so this right here will be a DFA eventually for the union of the original two. Yeah, that's the DFA we'll get out of it. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, I want to get through this. Um, so let's see. Well, let's uh, consider these two DFAs, and let's uh, we're going to make a DFA uh, M with no subscript, uh, and every other piece with no subscript. So we're just we're going to specify the five pieces of this DFA we're going to make in terms of the pieces of the original two uh, DFAs. Well, how did we make the states before? Well, how did we make the Q0, R0, R1, whatever states? How did we make those? Yeah, all combinations where... The first one comes from some state in the first DFA, and the second piece comes from the second DFA. Well, what do those look like to you? <coughs> what? Concatenation. Uh, not concatenation. It's actually the Cartesian product. So it's just the product of the two state sets from before. So Q here is going to be the states of the first one times the states of the second one. Pick any state out of the first machine and any state out of the second machine, put them together. So it's just Cartesian product here. I'm going to leave again the transition function to last to make it easier. Well, let's see. What are the elements of a Cartesian product? What are the actual elements themselves? of any Cartesian product, the, the elements themselves. Well, if I muck up the order of uh, Q2, let's just say I want to put first, and I put the order wrong, is that a different state? Yes. So the Cartesian products are ordered pairs, OK? So all of the states here, let's actually write this set out explicitly. So it's uh, ordered pairs, Q1, Q2. So this is an ordered pair because I put parentheses on it, where Q1 comes from the first machine and Q2 comes from the second one. So it's kind of like concatenation, but here I'm enforcing the order. So Q1 appears first, Q2 appears first because it makes things a lot easier when we make the transitions later. Okay, great. So what are states in this machine? Structurally, what are they? What are the elements of Q here? It's a two-word phrase. It starts with or and ends in ers. Do you need more syllables? It starts with order and ends with errors. <laughs> Ordered pairs. So all the states here are ordered pairs, okay? Not from a restaurant. You don't order pairs there. They're ordered pairs here. Well, let's see. What does Q0 then have to be? 
because it's a state of this new machine. What does it structurally have to be? It's a two-word phrase that we just discussed. It has to be an ordered pair. So Q0, then, has to be some ordered pair because, it's, because all states in this machine are ordered pairs. Well, what should this start state be in terms of the original machines? What should go in the first coordinate? Q01, the start state of the first machine. Okay? So the start state of the first machine goes there. And what goes in the second one? The Q02, as you might expect. Okay, great. Anyone lost? Don't be shy, it's okay. I feel for you. I had trouble when I first learned this stuff too. It's been five and a half years now. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, so it took me around five and a half years to get to proficient. So just tell yourself these proofs a hundred times and you'll be almost 50% there. <laughs> uh, I, I'm kidding. Uh, it's, uh, think about it at an intuitive level because that's the way that we're gonna look at it from now on, but we wanna actually state it precisely. So let's actually do the transition function. Well, in general, not just here, what does the transition function do? It takes what and what to what? Current state and input and outputs a state. What are states in this, in this machine? Ordered, order. ordered pairs. So the state thing in here must be an ordered pair. Cool. So. The, th the state that we're considering must be an ordered pair, no matter what. So, but this is just an arbitrary state. I I'm not considering anything about what the state is. It's just an arbitrary state. And we're going to consider an arbitrary character A. The A, A character might not be in the alphabet, but I'm just naming it something to actually be able to write it. Okay, well, let's see. Well, the transition function outputs a state. What are the states in this machine? You should be good at this. Ordered pairs, okay? So the result of this computation after applying a transition must be an ordered pair. And it's going to be a big ordered pair, so I'm going to leave some room. Well, let's see. Let's get an intuitive idea of what to do. In the machine on the right here, from the Q0, R0 state, how did we know what to do? Yeah, so we looked at both coordinates, Q0, R0. We figured out, let's just say on input 0 to make it concrete. We figured out, what did Q0 do on 0, on input 0? Well, we figured out, oh, it just went back to the same state. Uh, then we looked at R0, and we figured out where did it go on 0, and we saw it went to R1. And then from those two decisions, we figured out what state to go to. But more importantly, we looked at the original transition functions to figure out what to do. The Q0 one, we looked at the first machine and figured out, oh, what did its transition function do? And the R0, we looked at the transition function, saw what it did. So what do I do here? Well, how do I figure out what goes in this first coordinate here? What machine should I look at at the original transition function for the first coordinate? The, the first machine. And what is the name of the transition function in that case? Delta 1. Cool. So delta 1 goes here. Well, I'm looking at the original transition function, and i got to give it a state and an input. Well, what's the input in this case that I should consider? The, the input, not the state. The character A. So in both cases, I'm looking at the character A. Just like before, if we considered the zero transition, we looked at zero in both of the original machines. So in both cases, we're going to have the character be A. 
But in this case, what's the state? Q1. Yeah. So Q1 and A. So informally, we're at this ordered pair of states, figuring out where to go. We look at the first machine, saw what it did on the first state in the, in the pair. So Q1, what did it do? Whatever it does, the transition function will tell me. So what do you think is going to go in the second coordinate of this ordered pair? Yeah, just insert a 2 everywhere. Instead of 1, it's a 2. So delta 2 of Q2 with an A. So all we're doing is look at this ordered pair. See, we're going to figure out where to go. We're going to look at each of the pieces independently. The first piece comes from the first machine. Figure out what it did. Put that in the first coordinate of the result. Look at the second machine. Figure out what it did and put it in the second uh, coordinate. Does that make sense? Anyone lost? It's okay. I understand. If you're lost, there's something I need to uh, clarify. Or if there are any questions. If you don't ask questions, I can't help you. If there are no questions, okay. Well, is this DFA fully specified, this M machine that we're making? Is it fully specified? No. More interestingly, are the, the four pieces that we've made so far, uh, we did sigma because it's the same alphabet. The four pieces we specified, did they have anything to do with the union at all? Ah, so could I do the exact same thing, the four pieces exactly the same for intersection? Ah, isn't that really cool? You can prove a theorem and then get a bunch of other results for free out of it. So what changes between union and intersection here? The final states. The final states. So let's do the final states for union. So this is for union. So what are the states in this machine again? I promise it's the last time I ask. Ordered pairs. Well, what is the final, uh, what is F here structurally? What is it? It's a set of states, which are ordered pairs, right? So it's a set always. So it's a set uh, where, uh, where each state is an ordered pair. I need to redraw that. Q1, Q2. So remember, we're doing union here. So if Q1 is a final state or Q2 is a final state, are we done? Is that automatically a final state for union? If Q1 is final in the original machine or Q2 is a final state in the original machine, are we done? Cool. So how do I figure out that Q1 is a final state or not? Ah, it's an element of its final states, which in this case is F1. So Q1 is a member of F1, or Q2 is an element of F2. And that's it. So this construction, because we're doing the product of the states, what do you think the construction's name is called? The product of the states. Should I emphasize it more? The product construction. So this is called the product construction. Because we're taking the states, doing a Cartesian product of them, and making a giant DFA out of it. Okay, well, what if I wanted intersection? Yeah, and. So that would be an easy way to do it. So this would be for intersection. Oops. Intersection. Could I prove that more formally, though? For uh, intersection? 
Let's just say we got union. How do I proof uh, intersection? Anyone have any friends named Augustus? I do. His last name is De Morgan. He lived a long time ago, so the friendship has kind of died off a little bit. But um, anyone remember De Morgan? Was he famous for something? Yeah, De Morgan's laws. Oh, what did those tell us? It's something to do with union, yeah. Almost. So, to Morgan's Laws. So remember, where would you find something like this? Chapter zero. Chapter zero. So if we have two language, two sets really, uh, and we want to do the intersection of them, what you do is you complement the original pieces, union them, and then complement the entire thing. So we complement A and B, union, whatever that is, and then complement the entire thing. If we have union, do we have intersection from this? Yeah, why? What else do we have? We have closure under, complement. So if A and B are both regular, are not A, and not be both regular. Yeah, because we have closure and complement. If we have union, is A bar union A bar regular? Yeah, because A bar and B bar are regular. Well, if the result of the union is regular, is the complement over the entire thing have it be regular? Ah, so in fact, we do get intersection once we get union. So it's not that we can just put and here. Intuitively that makes sense, but we can prove it more formally that way. Cool. Any questions on product construction? So uh, you'll be able to now do a lot of the homework because a lot of the questions are of the form this property or or and this property. Okay? So you'll be able to do a lot of the questions that way. So that's actually really nice, that we can build DFAs that are small and, uh, for each of the individual pieces and then combine them just using the product construction. But I want you to note something that's very fundamental to computer science. For this construction right here, does it require clever thought of what the original two DFAs are? Do we need to do some introspection on what they are and then make some decisions about what to do? No. Could a computer do this? Ah, so this process, not only are they closed under an operation, which could be enough, in fact, there's an algorithm to do it. We can feed these to DFAs to a computer if you're using like JFLAP or something, and out pops out the DFA that you need. Isn't that pretty cool? So in fact, you can just encode these two DFAs up here into a computer program and then just form the product construction without even looking at what the DFAs really do. All you need to do is look at the individual transitions and each of the pairs of states and you're done. You don't need to do anything special here. You don't need to think about it and you just need to uh, write the program to actually do it. And there are many libraries to help you actually do this, which is, which, um, uh, is quite awesome and it reduces error. So you don't have to do it yourself, but you can if you want. But are there any questions about products at all? Okay, so we have a few minutes. Let's try to motivate the rest of the discussion. So what are the regular operations again? Union, concatenation, and star. How many of those so far have we proved are closed for regular languages are closed under them? Two? We proved two. Union, concatenation, and star. We did one. So let's move on to the next one. 
So concat. So we did union. Let's do concatenation. So remember, concatenation is take a string from the first language and stick on a string from the other language. Well, let's see. Here's an idea, again, that doesn't work. Uh, I like making analogies of this. My friend thought of this idea, and he always uh, ha struggles in 355 coming up with these ideas and is almost always wrong, and I want you to prove that he's wrong. So here's an idea that doesn't work. Uh, take the string and find some place in the middle of the string. The first part of it, uh, run on the first DFA, and then the second part of it, run on the second DFA. We don't have the issue anymore of um, uh, like having to rerun the string because each of the pieces is different. So I just run the first part on the first machine, and then the second part on the second machine. If both of them say yes, then it must be in the concatenation because the first piece came from the first one, second piece from, came from the second one. Sound reasonable? What's wrong with it? You're not in the middle. Right. Where's that middle? Where's that split? Could there be many possible splits? Could it be that I could split the string here or here or here or here? There are many possibilities that can happen. So we don't know where the middle is. So regular languages are not closed under concatenation then. Do you believe me? No. So just because one idea doesn't work, does that mean that it's not true? No. But consider this. What if we were able to guess where that middle is? So maybe we can just guess magically that the split is right here. Could we then just run the first piece on the first machine and then just switch over to the second machine for the second piece? Yeah, if we knew where that middle is, then we're all set. But we don't know where that is. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to consider a model where we can guess that magically, and then we can show that uh, languages are easy to do for concatenation for this model. But the problem is this model is more powerful than DFAs. But we'll also prove next time that we can get a DFA for that language anyway. So I'll see you tomorrow.